Good afternoon, Minister, friends and colleagues. You are all very welcome to the launch, this virtual launch of the 200, 2019 annual report for FLAC. We always enjoy catching up with our colleagues and friends from the NGO sector, the other independent law centres and the statutory, legal, academic, political and media world who normally attend the usual physical launch of our annual report. We're sad to be missing out on meeting you in person this year and a big thank you to all of you for joining us online and also a big hi to all of you from all of, all of the staff here in FLAC. Also a big hello and welcome to our invaluable volunteers, members of the PILA Alliance and barristers who assist us with our cases. We look forward to seeing you all in person as soon as it's possible. This launch has been streamed on Facebook and a recording will be available later. We are delighted that we had such a positive meeting with Minister McEntee last week and that she has agreed to launch this annual report. Our chair, Peter Ward, needs no introduction, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank Peter and the rest of FALAC Council who give their time, expertise and experience to provide invaluable support, guidance and strategic direction. I'll hand you over to Peter now, who will say a few words about our last year's Flack at 50 celebrations and also introduce the minister. Thank you. Thank you, Eilish, and welcome to everyone. Uh, and I hope you can all uh, uh, hear us loud and clear. 2019, it uh, was a year marked by a series of memorable uh, events to celebrate FLAC's 50th anniversary and we enjoyed the opportunity to bring together so many friends and supporters from the last 50 years in circumstances where many people travelled from near and far to reunite and reflect not only what, uh, on what has been achieved during that last 50 years but also to discuss what the future holds and what FLAC's uh, role in coming years uh, might most usefully be. Uh, it is clear that FLAC provides a welcoming space for an alternative legal world and a space where progressive ideas and uh, passion for the future development of our uh, society, where equal access to justice might become a greater reality, uh, those ideas and passions were shared uh, and nurtured to great effect uh, over the past uh, 12 months. The first event was on the 25th of February when the President Michael D. Higgins officially opened our new head office in Dorset Street uh, and we are extremely grateful for the continuing support of uh, President uh, Higgins for all of, our, uh, for all of our work. We had in the uh, long room of Trinity a celebration of the anniversary of the first ever flat clinic held back in April 1969 when David Burney and Candy Dennis McCullough and Vivian, the late Vivian Lavin uh, formed the organization. In May, we had a major conference on the theme of access to justice in association with the School of Law uh, in Trinity. That conference was opened by Chief Justice Frank Clark and distinguished speakers from the legal and human rights fields addressed a wide range of topics relating to access to uh, justice. We marked the 40th anniversary of the airy judgment of the European Court of Human Rights in October with a conference in the Law Society uh, on the EU Charter and the European Convention. And we were delighted to have Shiafra O'Leary, judge of the European Court of Human Rights, give a significant lecture along with a distinguished panel of speakers on European and human rights law. Our final event of the year was the 50th anniversary celebration uh, in the Radisson Hotel uh, in Dublin, which incorporated the Dave Ellis Memorial Lecture and former President Mary Robinson delivered that lecture in the context of a conversation with journalist Duran Nivrian and that was preceded by a panel discussion uh, with many participants uh, who had uh, been active in FLAC over the past 50 years looking back at those five uh, decades and it was a most uh, enjoyable night and a suitable reflection I think on the a huge number of people uh, who've contributed to FLAC's work uh, over the decades. We do believe that FLAC uh, inhabits a unique position on the Irish legal landscape uh, and its many contributions to equal access to justice are only made possible because of the 
incredible support we receive on an ongoing basis. We obviously, uh, in the first instance, uh, completely depend upon uh, and appreciate the work of our volunteers in the uh, clinics, uh, and they use their professional skill and expertise uh, to ensure that a huge number of our citizens get uh, access to basic legal information uh, in the first instance to which they otherwise uh, may have no access whatsoever. Those volunteers include the hundreds of lawyers around the country who volunteer uh, at flat clinics. It includes also the uh, very large number of volunteers who are part of the PILA pro bono uh, register and the lawyers who support our individual uh, casework, the members of student FLAC societies in the colleges and the universities and all of the volunteers in FLAC uh, head office itself. We will to thank the Citizens Information Board and the staff and management of the local Citizens Information Centres and uh, the community-based organisations who facilitate and host uh, our flat clinics uh, all over the country. Uh, in particular, I would like on behalf of Flat Council to thank our uh, amazing flat staff under the direction of Eilish Barry, as Chief Executive. Uh, our staff who have worked with us so long over the years have a commitment and an en energy and an idealism uh, that really uh, does uh, make our uh, contribution to access to justice possible uh, and uh, we are extremely grateful to them for it. In particular, on this occasion, I would like to uh, particularly acknowledge the uh, incredible contribution of Jackie Heffernan, who steps down this year uh, as the Information Line Coordinator. Uh, Jackie has, for so many years now, uh, uh, quietly exhibited a dedication and a passion and a commitment to Flax work uh, that is uh, unsurpassed. We all thank her most sincerely for that incredible uh, contribution and we're very uh, grateful to her, uh, not only for that work but for agreeing to stay on as a uh, volunteer on the phone line. Uh, Jackie's contribution has been absolutely at the uh, front line of uh, service uh, provision uh, in FLAC and uh, we are extremely grateful uh, to her for that incredible uh, service. We want to thank uh, particularly today also our supporters who've uh, contributed through donations and grants. We want to thank our funders, philanthropic government departments, statutory bodies, the Law Society, the Bar Council, law firms, solicitors and barristers and individuals who ensure that we have sufficient funding to keep our work going at the level uh, to which uh, uh, we're now accustomed. Minister for Justice and Equality, uh, Helen McEntee has kindly agreed to launch our annual report for 2019. We're delighted to have established such a good working relationship with the Department of Justice uh, over the years, and we look forward to working with Minister McEntee in her new role. Due to the ongoing situation, she has understandably been unable to uh, join us uh, live on this occasion. However, she has uh, uh, very kindly furnished a recorded video to virtually launch today's report. And we will now hear from our new Minister for Justice, uh, Helen McEntee. Uh, I'm delighted to be able to speak with you today to launch FLAX 2019 annual report. I'd like to thank Eilish Barry for the kind invitation. Of course, I would much prefer have been with you in person, but I'm pleased that I can at least join you virtually. Because FLAC is an important organisation, the service you provide to the public, and in particular to disadvantaged and marginalised communities, really is truly invaluable. 2019 was a very special year, which marked 50 years since the first FLAC clinic was held by then law students David Byrne, Ian Candy, Dennis McCullough, and the late Vivian Lavin. Since those early days, FLAC has gone from strength to strength, and it's very clear from the vast amount of work outlined in this report that the need for your services are stronger than ever. In 2019, 26,995 individuals received legal information and advice from FLAC. A total of 14,526 people received basic legal advice at the free legal advice clinics in 72 locations across the country. 
and there were 12,469 calls to Flax telephone information line in 2019 alone. I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the work of the 580 volunteers working in Flax free legal advice clinics, without whom the many services I've just outlined that are offered by FLAC would not be possible. Your generosity with your time and expertise does not go unnoticed, and I would like to thank you for your commitment to the service that you provide and to the people who rely on them. I also want to recognise the tireless efforts of the team behind FLAC's information phone line, which has seen a significant increase in calls, in particular during this difficult period of COVID-19. I want to give a special mention to Jackie Heffernan, FLAC's information line coordinator, who I know will be stepping down from her role after 16 years in the near future. I have no doubt that her service and presence at FLAC will be sorely missed, and I want to wish her the very best for the future. Areas where demand for advice have been highest are family law and employment. This has been further compounded in 2020 by COVID-19, which has impacted on so many people's employment, and it's also raised issues of family law for many people. In 2019, FLAC opened 112 case files. 61 of these case files were opened on behalf of callers to FLAC's Roma Legal Clinic. I see that housing and discrimination cases were again the predominant work of areas in your case files. You also secured a number of significant outcomes and settlements in cases involving social welfare, employment discrimination and discrimination claims. Again, I would like to congratulate the Public Interest Law Alliance, or PILA, which is celebrating its own milestone, having been established 10 years ago this year. In 2019, through the Pro Bono Referral Scheme, an impressive 130 social justice organisations were provided with legal assistance by private practitioners acting pro bono. Invaluable work has been carried out as well by the Roma Legal Advice and Advocacy Clinic, having been only established in June 2018. In 2019, FLAC held 32 drop-in clinics, attended by 85 people and had 61 active case files for Roma clients. Travellers, Roma and others from disadvantaged backgrounds can often encounter barriers to pursuing remedies through existing systems. This increases their vulnerability to poverty and violations of their rights. If members of the Roma community are going to be able to protect their rights, to challenge inequalities and combat social exclusion, it's vital that they would have knowledge of legal rights, that they would have knowledge of entitlements and services, and also access to legal information, advice and representation. As I mentioned at the very outset, I value the service you provide to the public, and in particular to disadvantaged and marginalised communities immensely. I'm really pleased that my department was in position back in 2019 to provide €40,000 in funding for FLAX Roma, Roma Clinic initiative, in addition to the 98000 department funding towards the ongoing information, advice and advocacy work carried out by FLAC on a daily basis. I am of course very conscious that FLAC, like many other organisations, face significant resourcing issues at this time. This is in the context of exceptional demands on public funds and resources right across the board. It is further complicated by a fall in revenues and the ongoing demand for COVID emergency and Brexit sectorial supports. While not all demands can be met in such difficult circumstances, I do want to assure you that I and my department will work to achieve the best possible outcomes for you in this regard. There are of course many areas in which FLAC and my department have shared priorities. A Family Justice Oversight Committee has recently been established within my department. It comprised of departmental officials, members of the Judiciary, the Court Service, the Legal Aid Board and the Department of Children and Youth Affairs. The committee itself will focus on developing a high quality family law system. Its work is likely to involve a broad consideration of the best means of providing access to various family law mechanisms. That consideration will also allow us for an examination of the recommendations contained in the Joint Committee on Justice and Equality Report on Reform of the Family Law System. This concerns the need for a full review of the legal aid scheme, with particular regard to means test rates, contribution requirements and overall eligibility. The enactment of legislation on the establishment of a family court is also a commitment in the programme for government. The government has this week approved the drafting of a family court bill and the publication along with it of the general scheme of the bill. 
the Family Court Bill will be a key element of the development of a more efficient, a more user-friendly, a more family-friendly court system that firstly puts families at the centre of its activities, secondly it provides access to specialist supports, thirdly it will encourage the use of alternative dispute resolution and family law proceedings, so mediation, fourth it will be accessible and capable of responding in a much speedier manner to their requirements and to those that it is supposed to serve. And finally, it will ensure that cases can be dealt with by the most appropriate court, irrespective of the value of the assets involved in the case. The publication of the general scheme really is an important first step in what is a lengthy and ongoing process of improving how people are able to resolve family-based problems that require a legal solution. The government is also committed to implementing reforms to the administration of civil justice in the state, covering such matters as the more efficient, the more effective deployment of court and judicial resources. This will be guided by the report of a group which has been chaired by the former President of the High Court, Mr Justice Peter Kelly, and this is a report that will be finalised very shortly. It will be actively considered by me, by my department, and its recommendations will inform appropriate policy and legislative responses in this area. The Government also appreciates that both the COVID emergency and the potential negative impacts of Brexit on the overall housing market will make Awalia even more relevant for more vulnerable citizens for the foreseeable future. The Programme for Government has therefore committed to the continued resourcing and delivery of Awalia. The 2021 review of Awalia, which will inform this commitment, and the future enhancement and the delivery of the programme. The ongoing insights of FLAC into the possible enhancements of Awalia to enhance its operational effectiveness really are appreciated and I have no doubt they will be an invaluable asset and an important contribution to the overall review process. Finally, I want to end by commending the chairperson, council members, staff and volunteers on your resilience, your adaptability and your customer focus which really has ensured continuity of service to the public in the face of an unprecedented global pandemic. Your contribution is appreciated by me personally, but most of all, I'm quite sure by the 27,000 people you helped in 2019. I'm very happy to launch this report, and I want to wish FLAC the very best in the future with their valuable work. Thank you. I would like to thank you, Minister, for launching our report and the extremely positive meeting we had with you last week to discuss our shared aim of access to justice and also our, our problem in relation to funding. I'd also like to thank you so much for your appreciation and endorsement of the work of FLAC. We look forward to working with you in the department in relation to the review of the, uh, uh, of, of the administration of justice, which you, which you mentioned, which will shortly be published. We would also look forward to working with you on the review of the Iwalia scheme and the development of the family court system, which we hope will include a, a review of the legal aid system. The minister has mentioned a number of matters that I now would like to draw your attention to. Before COVID, our information and advice services were under huge pressure uh, in 2019. There was already a significant demand for information and advice as to what people are, are, are entitled to. In 2019, there were 12,469 calls to our telephone information line, 24,001% concerned family law, and employment law queries rose by 17% and constituted 20% of the calls. In relation to the legal advice clinics, 14,526 people received basic legal advice from our free legal advice clinics in 72 locations around the country. Family law also accounted for the majority of queries there with 34% and employment law queries rose by over 10%. You can see that overall family law and employment law are dominating the queries both to the phone lines and in the legal advice clinics. I think it's significant that employment law queries rose by 17% to the phone line and 10% to the legal advice clinics. And there was a 24% increase in discrimination law queries to the clinics. Our do domestic violence queries rose by 11% in the clinics and by 23% to the phone line. Lay litigants constitute approximately 4% of the queries to the phone line. We very much regret in FLAC that we do not have the resources to provide 
comprehensive assistance to lay litigants who are in desperately trying to navigate the complex legal system by themselves. And it is to be hoped that the review of the administration of justice, which the minister referred to, which is to be published shortly, will take on board our repeated recommendations on the need to provide properly for lay litigants. The importance and the need for FLAC's public interest law project, PILA, which was 10 years old in 2019, was highlighted by the recent High Court judgment, which was in the case taken by the Friends of the Irish Environment, where the judgment held that legal aid is not available for organisations and groups. In 2019, 130 community and voluntary groups received legal assistance from lawyers acting pro bono through the uh, pro, pro bono referral scheme. The most common areas of assistance were housing, homelessness, corporate governance, data protection and travellers rights. I'd like to congratulate PILA for winning the Pro Bono Team of the Year Award in the Irish Law Awards last year. FLAC, as you all know, is an independent law centre and it brings a number of cases in the public interest, cases that may have an impact beyond the individual. In 2019, FLAC had two, uh, 112 case files and the most prevalent issues were housing, discrimination and social welfare. During 2019, we were delighted to receive funding from the Community Foundation for Ireland to work with a steering group made up of traveller groups to set up a traveller-specific legal service, which has now been established. FLAC initiated 10 separate judicial review cases in the area of social housing. Sinead will later on discuss some of the issues arising from the case files. From a policy point of view, 50 years ago, our raison d'etre was to campaign for comprehensive legal aid. It was fitting that we made it a priority policy area in 2019. The Chief Justice at our Access to Justice conference in May set out very powerful uh, arguments for resourcing the legal aid system. And we were very pleased that the Joint Oireachtas Committee in its review of family law of the family law system supported our recommendations for a root grant review of the legal aid system. We were also pleased that the UN human rights body CERD adopted FLAC's recommendations on extending the scope of legal aid to include, um, uh, to include discrimination claims and social welfare claims. Legal, legal aid was also the subject of another joint Oireachtas committee which hasn't yet uh, published its report. But the Law Society and the Bar Council supported our call for better legal aid, as did the Chair of the Legal Aid Board, and I'd like to welcome him here, here today. In our election campaign, our Right to Justice campaign, we were also pleased that so many politicians committed to review of the legal system. And in the last week, we also welcomed the call for, for review, which has been echoed by the National Women's Council in its pre-budget submission, a feminist recovery plan, and the Bar of Ireland has also raised the issue of legal aid. In the area of debt, Paul organised and participated in the Where To Now for Hard Cases seminars with the irrepressible David Hall from the Irish Mortgage Holders Association. We know facing into the consequences of the pandemic that persistent mortgage debt remains since the last recession with over 26,000 to count in arrears. To these will be undoubtedly added people who find themselves with new debt problems. We suggest that a COVID debt code to deal with both legacy debt, existing mortgage arrears, new mortgage arrears, and also unsecured debt needs to be considered by the central bank to deal with what MABS this week described as the tsunami of debt that will be facing us. We have seen that the impact of COVID uh, means that access to justice is even more important in a pandemic. Flax Information Line provides an insight into the acute and stressful situations that people are facing, who've been, and it has been overwhelmed with complex new queries from people who have lost their jobs, who may have had their wages cut or their hours cut, who may be unable to pay their rent, who may be facing eviction or repossessions, who may be unable to work because of illness or lack of childcare or, or health and safety concerns for their, themselves or loved ones. FLAC's public interest law project PILA has also been inundated with requests for, for legal assistance from community and voluntary groups. And in the first six months of this year, referrals to the pro bono referrals uh, scheme increased by 50% 
So, so far in 2020, 170 organisations have been provided with legal services via PINA. What we can see from the 2019 annual report, and which has been spotlighted by the COVID crisis, is the acute need for information, advocacy, legal advice and legal aid in the areas of law that most impact on vulnerable and disadvantaged groups and individuals. Areas of law that are largely not dealt with by the Legal Aid Board with its strict means test, its delays running to over six months in some centres and rigid exclusions. We need that urgent review of the legal aid system to ensure that the issues that FLAC deal with on a daily basis, such as housing, discrimination and employment law, are dealt with by the Legal Aid Board. This is not an abstract ideal. Comprehensive legal aid is an urgent prerequisite to a fair and accessible system that will ensure equal access to justice at a time when it is, when it is most needed. The pandemic and the work throughout 2019 has also highlighted a need for the employment, housing, debt and social welfare legislative infrastructure to be reviewed to ensure that people have a basic floor of, of rights and that they are provided with fair procedures and have access to fair remedies. Black is also concerned that the difficulties claimants face in accessing legal assistance is compounded by the growing delays in courts and tribunals as a result of the pandemic. While we showcased online courts in our Access to Justice conference last May, we believe that it should only be seen as a partial response and may be unsuitable for, for certain cases and people who may face literacy, language and certain mental health issues. The digital divide also needs to be tackled and where possible hearings should be held safely within the, the existing physical infrastructure. 50 years since our foundation, FLAC plays a vital part in the legal community with its focus on vulnerable and disadvantaged in society. We may be one of the few places where people can get even basic assistance. The, the need for equal access to justice is still very much evident as detailed in, in our 2019 annual report. Sinead Lucy is FLAC's managing solicitor. She also needs no introduction. She's a brilliant lawyer and her brilliance is matched by her commitment to use the law to advance the rights of people experiencing poverty, deprivation and exclusion. We're delighted that she won the, the Lawyer of the Year Award at last year's Irish, uh, Irish Law Awards. I should also mention that she's current chair of the Law Society Human Rights Committee. Our colleagues in the independent law centres will no doubt agree as to just how difficult it is to keep working on cases in the public interest and yet how important it is to keep bringing them. And I would like to thank Sinead and the team, Maureen Gourley, Chris Bowes, Chris McCann, who's just started in the Traveller Service, for the incredibly hard work and the resilience they show in pursuing these very difficult and at times extremely harrowing cases. The cases themselves are obviously really important for the individual claimants, but they also throw up serious issues concerning the sort of society we live in and how the state re responds to people in extreme poverty and deprivation. Sinead. Good afternoon and thank you for those kind words, Eilish. Also, thank you to Peter, our chair, Apologies. Um, thank you to Peter, our chair, and all those who have joined us online. 2019 was a busy year in terms of the casework undertaken by FLAC. And I also want to thank my colleagues involved in that work, Maureen Gourley, Christopher Bowes, and Christopher McCann, for their commitment and unstinting work throughout the year. In addition to the support of our other colleagues in FLAC, FLAC Council and Eilish, our chief executive. I also want to say a very special thanks to all those barristers who so kindly act on behalf of our clients for their, their generous commitment of their time, their energy and their expertise. There are too many to mention, but you know who you are. In our annual report, we have highlighted a number of outcomes throughout the year. And in the brief time that I have today, I will just touch on some of the thematic issues that have emerged. The legal clinic that, is, that we run for the Roma community, and which is directly funded by the Department of Justice, accounts for a large portion of our work. 
In that regard, I want to also acknowledge and thank Danute Nye, a Roma advocate who assists us with outreach work, advocacy and translation at the clinic. He is an invaluable resource within his community and also to us in our work. And I hope that Danut has joined us this morning. In the year of COVID, it is timely to reflect on one of the social welfare appeals that we dealt with last year, and which concerned a matter that came to broader public attention this year, namely the powers of social welfare inspectors who attend at airports and ports to investigate suspected breaches of the social welfare code. Flax client that we highlight in our annual report is a Roma man in his 60s and in receipt of disability allowance since 2011. He has almost no spoken English and can neither read nor write. He was approached by a social welfare inspector in Dublin airport in 2018, who was accompanied by a member of Vanguardia Shia Kona. He was questioned in English about his social welfare claim. He had no idea what he was being asked but produced his identification, thinking that the officers were conducting some form of customs or immigration check. He was then invited to sign a handwritten statement prepared by the social welfare inspector, which he did and proceeded to board his flight as he was traveling to Romania for medical treatment. It was only on his return to Ireland a week or so later that he discovered, to his surprise, that his disability allowance payment had been suspended on the instruction of the social welfare inspector, as it emerged that the piece of paper he unwittingly signed stated that he was leaving Ireland for good and was withdrawing his claim. This in turn led to an investigation and a huge overpayment being assessed against our client by the department. At the appeal hearing where Flack appeared on his behalf, and which dealt with a range of issues, including the lawful basis for stopping payments when a claimant travels abroad for medical treatment. We asked that the social welfare inspector would attend in person so that he could be examined as to the procedure at the airport and the basis for the questioning, and in particular, the handwritten note. We were informed, unfortunately, that this was not possible as the social welfare inspector had moved department and so those issues went unexplored. Submissions were made in any event as to the unfairness of the process and ultimately the appeal was largely allowed, reducing, reducing the overpayment against our client by some 85,000 euros. It was no surprise then to flag this year when it was reported that social welfare inspectors were apparently doing blanket checks on passengers departing the state as regards their social welfare st status, and with a high proportion of those flights being bound for Romania and Moldova. Flack remains concerned through its casework that the legal basis for such blan blanket checks has not been addressed by the department in terms of the reasonable cause required by the legislation as a prerequisite for such checks. And nor has the process behind a stated review of those who had their payments caught on foot, on foot of such checks been made public. The outcome of the review, review also remains unknown and Flack continues to seek accountability from the department in that regard. Another notable feature of our casework in 2019 is the gendered nature of the discrimination experienced by the Roma community. Based on our case files, it appears that Roma women experience discrimination in relation to access to goods and services more frequently than their male counterparts. We can only assume that this is because many Roma women have a very distinct form of ethnic dress unique to the community that makes them easily identifiable. We highlight in our annual report where the traditional long skirt worn by a Roma woman, our client, became a barrier to accessing employment in the hospitality sector. And also a very shocking incident, incident where two young Roma women were forcibly ejected from a Dublin bus. While we are happy that the Flat Clinic was able to assist these women to assert their rights and seek redress, we know that this is only the tip of the iceberg in relation to the experience of discrimination by the Roma community and much more needs to be done to combat such discrimination. This includes educating individuals how they can seek redress for such discrimination. 
providing legal aid in respect of discrimination claims, which isn't currently available, and also considering whether our equality legislation is actually adequate to provide redress for this form of intersectional discrimination, as it doesn't fall neatly within the parameters of either the gender or the race ground. Finally, I want to highlight the number of cases that were instituted on behalf of the traveller community by FLAC during 2019. All these cases related to another form of discrimination that is all too familiar. The failure of local authorities to provide traveller specific accommodation and apparently arbitrary decision making in relation to social housing allocations to members of the traveller community. This failure to provide adequate and appropriate, appropriate accommodation to members of the traveller community is compounded by draconian legislation allowing for the forcible removal of roadside families with little or no safeguards to protect the family unit and the rights of the adults and children involved. The need for legal representation for travellers in dealing with these issues, as Eilish mentioned already, was acknowledged by traveller groups themselves and the Community, Community Foundation of Ireland this year when FLAC was granted funding to establish a dedicated traveller legal service to intensify this legal work and resource the community itself in terms of training and advocacy, which service and this service was launched earlier this year. Again, this service is a significant development, but much more needs to be done to empower the traveller community to combat the daily discrimination experienced collectively and individually. Noting that the Minister for Justice has kindly provided an input this morning in launching FLAC's annual report, we would ask her that repeal of the so-called criminal trespass legislation, a piece of legislation condemned by the European Committee on Social Rights in 2015, and which is symbolically seen as a rejection of travellers' nomadic culture, an intrinsic, an intrinsic part of the ethnic identity of the community would be brought forward without delay. The legislation is draconian and cruel and has no place on the statute book of a state that prides itself on being socially progressive and indeed protecting the rights of everyone in society equally. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thank you, Sinead. As everybody knows, we operate legal advice clinics in 72 locations around the country. And I'd like to reiterate the thanks to the Citizens Information Board and the CISs for our funding and facilitating those clinics. I also want to, to point out that during 2019, we bid a sad farewell to valuable members of the volunteer team, Jay and Kuda, but we're delighted to welcome Ingrid and more recently Sinead Scales to the volunteer team. I want to thank again the 580 plus volunteers who advise at these clinics, who as President Michael D. Higgins said last year at the opening of the FLAC building, are an uplifting example of participative democracy and, democracy and citizenship. Because of COVID, we had to close the face-to-face -face clinics. And I want to thank all of the volunteers and staff of FLAC who worked so hard to ensure that people would continue to have access to information and advice during the pandemic through leaflets and the phone advice clinics. Their work ensures, as our next speaker says, that some people are, who contact us have an opportunity to be heard and informed. Balan Lee Fawoken qualified a solicitor, as a solicitor in 2011. She is a bachelor and a master's of law and a, diploma in, and, and a diploma in employment law. She currently works in PwC. She learned Irish for the Law Society exams and has visited all of our 26 counties. She's been volunteering in FLAX face-to-face uh, -face clinics for a number of years and more recently in the phone advice clinics. She'll provide us with a, a flavour of what happens in those clinics now. Good afternoon, distinguished guests and attendees. I'm delighted to be here to share my experience as a FLAC volunteer at the launch of the FLAC 2019 annual report. Before I begin, I would like to congratulate FLAC for all the work they have done 
and are still doing. And to commend all who have contributed their time and funds to help FLAG achieve its goals. Together, we can be stronger and better. As you heard, my name is Bolanle for welcome, but you can call me Bola. I live in Dublin city and have been working in corporate immigration for three years now. My FLAG experience began when I volunteered at the FLAG Immigration Clinic in 2018, which I attend in person once a month, or currently over the phone if the need arises. The clinic is open to the public on an appointments basis. It is a free confidential service to provide legal information, advice, or referral on immigration matters. Prior to COVID-19, the one-on-one -on -one sessions were held at Old Cornell Street. The clinic ran for about one hour, 15 minutes, with up to four appointees at allocated time slots. I have had the opportunity to meet and speak to individuals from diverse backgrounds, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, gender, and family status. And each person has a story to tell. Why do they come to this clinic? Some individuals found themselves in the situation where they needed immigration law advice because they had listened to friends or family members who misinformed them, or they had a lack of understanding, or were in abusive relationships. The queries include soon to expire residency permits, regularizing immigration status, EU treaty rights or naturalization questions. This is a huge burden on their shoulders. And some of the people who present at the clinic experience feelings of anxiety, depression, and fear. Some feel so afraid, they think the guards might knock on their door and whisk them away. As a volunteer solicitor, I need to understand not just the query, but also how the person is feeling and the point of view. My goal during the session is to empathize with them by actively listening and to empower them by advising of the options available, including referrals to other bodies, in order to make their situation better for them. Where there is a family law element, for example, child custody or divorce, I advise them to book an appointment with the family law flag clinic. I remember a woman who came in with her six week old baby who looked adorable, but the woman was very downhearted. Our concern was that her relationship with her Irish partner was breaking down and she was concerned how this would impact her and her baby's immigration status. I said to her that as the father of the baby was born in Ireland in the 90s, her child is automatically an Irish citizen by birth. Therefore, an Irish passport should be obtained for the child. And then she can make an application by virtue of the Zambrani judgment to obtain residency for herself being the parent of an Irish citizen child. I recall how she was so relieved by this information and was glad she got the opportunity to seek advice. Due to COVID-19, the clinics now take place over the phone, usually at a preferred date and time for my home. Despite the pandemic situation, I am still able to keep volunteering, though the physical interaction body language is missing. I can detect from their voices how they are feeling and try to put their minds at ease, providing them with the necessary information and wishing them the best in their endeavors. The flag clinics provide the opportunity for people to be heard and informed. Lives are being transformed for the better, and indeed, a little advice does go a long way. Buruma Agat, thank you. Thank you so much, Bola. 
I just want to reiterate our thanks to all our funders in the statutory sector, the Law Society and the Bar of Ireland, philanthropy, our sustaining and supporting partners and all the lawyers who assist us. I also want to thank very sincerely the staff for their commitment, passion and idealism. They've been absolutely magnificent in their response to COVID and their determination to ensure that people will continue to have access to information and advice. I have to make particular mention of the phone line team who've been under considerable pressure to deal with calls from very distressed and vulnerable individuals who may have nowhere else to turn to. I want to echo what the Minister had said and what Peter has said and to pay a special tribute to our colleague Jackie Heffernan who with Zen like Cam has managed the telephone information line. She's trained in countless interns over the years and anyone who has any experience of FLAC will know what a wonderful human being she is. We're absolutely distraught that she's set, stepping down, but are delighted that she won't be leaving us all together. I know it's risky to pick out certain people, but it would be remiss of me not to thank people who were of such support to us during COVID. And in particular, I'd like to thank Kierna Hearn, Keith Walsh, the Family Lawyers Association, and the Pro Bono Associates, Ethna Lynch and Caroline Minnick and also Connell and Kira from the Bar Council, who all reached out to us to offer us support at a very critical time. These events take a huge amount of work, so a huge big thanks to Gronya and Tom, and also to Susan and Caroline. Finally, a very sincere thanks to the people who contact us for information and advice. We are acutely aware of the gaps that exist in terms of access to information, legal advice, advocacy and legal aid. We at FLAC cannot begin to meet that unmet legal need that is there, but we are committed to working towards closing those gaps by continuing to highlight them and advocating for improved access to justice. Thank you very much. Thank you.